Welcome back, my friends, to the Mail Right Real Estate Agent Podcast Show. This is episode 102, and we have a special guest today. He's actually my home inspector, uh, and beyond that, all my clients use him too. Mr. Glenn Kleint from Inspect It First is joining us today on our podcast. Glenn, would you give the audience a little shout out and uh, let them know who you are and what you do? Hey, good morning. Uh, Glenn Kleint with Inspected First uh, Property Inspection. And I do uh, commercial and residential property inspections throughout San Diego County and in the Riverside. And I've uh, been doing it for about three and a half years. All right. Uh, I'm going to let Jonathan introduce himself, and then we'll come back over to you and start start in on the uh, the third degree. <laughs> <laughs> the third degree. Hi there, folks. I'm the founder of Mail Right and this podcast with my great co-host, Thomas. And we're a Facebook lead generation platform system. So if that sounds interesting, want more good quality leads, go to mail-right.com. Back to you, Thomas. Thank you. And I'm Thomas J. Nelson, residential realtor here in beautiful San Diego, California, where I'm never too busy for your referrals. And I do serve military clients parents of UCSD and university students, and of course, I love serving the senior community here in San Diego. And how I serve them in part is with uh, Mr. Glenn Kleint here, who's uh, our gracious guest. Uh, Glenn, I know you're a busy guy, so thanks for being here today. Oh, thank you so much for having me, Thomas. I appreciate it. Yeah, the market's keeping you busy right now, isn't it? <laughs> oh, it is. <laughs> yeah. So let's get into home inspections. First of all, uh, something that surprised some of my friends who are uh, practicing real estate in other states is there is a difference uh, state to state about the requirements of being a, a home inspector. Do you need to be licensed in California? No, surprisingly not. In California, you do not have to be licensed. Uh, uh, you've got to be licensed for just about everything else that you do in California. Uh, you want to provide, uh, for instance, home furnishings. You have to be licensed to do home furnishings. Huh. You, of course, have to be licensed as a real estate agent. Uh, yep. Appraisers have to be uh, licensed, but property inspectors, not so much. There is no requirement uh, for licensing in California. So what do you go through to basically become a home inspector? I mean, is there any criteria before you can just call yourself one? In California, technically, No. Wow. Uh, but, uh, and, and that's where California is kind of the wild west, uh, in a, in a lot of, uh, in a lot of ways that way. Uh, now as an inspected first, uh, franchise owner, we are, uh, trained at a two week, uh, franchise school, uh, about 120 hours of classroom training. Then we're required to join or, or pass what's called the national home inspectors exam about a 200 question exam and then we're required to join uh, an organization called ASHI which is the American Society of Home Inspectors okay. and that's where our professional standards actually come from is from ASHI and the problem in California of course is without any uh, licensing requirements it's difficult to know what professional standard your inspector might be inspecting to. Okay. And, hey, and that's where Ashy comes in. Glenn, uh, real quick, whatever you did with your microphone, um, it kind of <laughs> took took away from your vocal there. Oh, sorry about that. I moved some papers. Okay, yeah, there we go. Um, so uh, what I'm getting at by asking you this, because, uh, you know, obviously I know this from, from uh, interviewing you. When, when my regular home inspector told me he was going to retire, I, of course, was out looking for a new one, and that's how we met. And uh, that was one of the things that impressed me was that, like my inspector I was using at the time, you had gone through and gotten these certifications, even though they're not technically required in California. Uh, and so the point being, there is a huge difference from uh, home inspector to home inspector as far as their qualifications and their experience. Right. Yeah, that's, that's, that's very much the case. And, and without uh, licensing, uh, it's difficult, like I say, to know what professional standard it's being inspected to. Right. So the question I have is, 
Uh, well, let's start with this. Uh, why do people hire you to begin with? What, what is the general purpose of a home inspector? Well, uh, the general inspector, we, now um, uh, both commercial and residential are treated the same way. So be it a, a building or a, a home, the inspection is still the same. Okay. Uh, but they hire us to examine generally the condition of the, uh, the home and all the major systems and components of the home from roof to crawl space, everything in between, appliances, electric, plumbing, uh, the whole nine yards. So they want a, a general assessment of uh, the condition of the property, how the systems are working. Uh, and it's not an exhaustive engineering examination by any means. I am not a contractor, so I'm not uh, quoting on any repairs that are being done. I'm just calling out those systems and uh, uh, items within the home that need uh, particular attention, like I say, from roof to crawl space and everything in between. Okay. So – when when somebody is uh, you know I obviously sell residential real estate so when when I'm calling you out for a home inspection the two times I'm calling you are when I take a listing if my uh, seller has taken my advice and done a pre-listing inspection uh, meaning uh, they're going to have their own home inspected by you before they even put their home on the market to find out if there's anything they need to do uh, either repair wise. Or if they're not going to do the repairs, they can take that into consideration when settling on an asking price uh, or at least have a credit in mind. And then the other time I call on you, of course, is when I've uh, sold a buyer a home and we're in escrow and we're doing our due diligence on the condition of the home. So how often would you say, uh, because what I was surprised is when I moved to S Southern California to San Diego, in the Bay Area, it's just normal that you do a pre-listing inspection. But down here, it was not the norm. And uh, I'm wondering, like, what percentage of the inspections do you do that are pre-MLS versus in escrow? Uh, the pre-MLS, I would say, is probably 5% of my business. Wow. Uh, it's, it's not very many. And, and, it, and it is surprising uh, that more are not done. I know... As you say, in Northern California, they're, they're, they're very prevalent. But yeah. down here in San Diego, a lot of people still don't do them. So it's not a large percentage of the business. The majority of it is the uh, actual purchase inspection. Okay. And then what is the difference between doing uh, the two types of inspections I mentioned? Because I know uh, one is more in intensive than the other. Uh, well, they're both the same inspection. Okay. Uh, physically on site, they're the same inspection. They take about the same amount of time. Okay. The difference is in the report. Uh, for the pre-MLS uh, inspection, the seller doesn't necessarily want to know what the serial numbers are on all the equipment in the house. They don't need to know necessarily all the systems that are working just fine, whereas the buyer wants the reassurance that everything is documented as working just fine. Right. Uh, for the pre-sale, I stress simply with the seller what's wrong, what needs to be fixed. The report is maybe 10 pages long, whereas that same inspection for the buyer, the report might be 40 pages long. Okay. So there's just the level of the detail that's in the report. Okay. That's, that's the only difference between them. Well, and, um, and just to sidebar a little, I know, um, what, what happens a lot is you, you are, have an obligation to report everything that you discover, and that includes uh, code violations, even if the home isn't subject to code. So do you, how do you handle that? Because obviously, you know, from my point of view, I want my client to know everything about the house, but I also don't want them uh, getting freaked out about the laundry list of perfect world reports um, that don't apply to the house. Um, right. it's, so... Uh, on, on your end of it, how do you guide the clients that are buying a home through the differences of what really is a health and safety or repair need versus uh, that future honey-do list? Yeah, it, it's, it's all in the presentation, and it's all in discussing what the, what the issue is. Let's take, for example, uh, railings on uh, 
guardrails and handrails of stairways. That's a, a it's a real common issue that I find. Right. Uh, when the stairways were built, they were built to code, but that code was changed maybe 20, 30, 40 years ago. And now those sta- those handrails and guardrails don't meet modern code. And so I'll call it out to the buyer, for instance, to, and, and explain to them when the stairway was built, it was built to code. It's not to modern code. So you might want to consider upgrading it to get it to the proper safety condition. Right. But there's certainly no requirement that that be done. So you're not required to go back and update it. Another example would be GFCIs. In, whole, in older homes, ground fault circuit interrupter uh, outlets didn't even exist. Right. So there's no requirement to go back and backfit them, but it's a sensible safety upgrade to do so. And so that's how I kind of present it to the uh, to the buyer and to the seller as well. Right. Just so they're aware, okay, you don't have ground faults in the kitchen. When the house was built, it didn't need it but it's a sensible upgrade to do so now. uh, Right. And that one's kind of an arguable safety issue, even though it's, you know, grandfathered in code wise. I I know that one comes up a lot on a request for repairs by a buyer. Yes, Um, it does. But, you know, and then like to your point about the, um, like the, the railings and in stairwells, I know the big issue is the, um, the uprights uh, are too wide and, and children can stick their head through them. And so that's not something we're going to ask the seller to change because that would be considered an upgrade, not a repair. Uh, however, God forbid that wasn't brought to the attention of my clients that have kids. So I, that's something as an agent, I want them to know all these things. And it kind of falls on kind of the teamwork that you and I have or any realtor and inspector has of explaining it in, in an appropriate way that makes them aware of the concerns. but keeps it realistic um, as far as expectations of what the seller is and isn't going to do. I'm leading up to my question, uh, our first controversial question. (laughs) How often do you run into uh, pushback from your uh, other realtors? Do you ever get a realtor that says, hey, um, don't write that one down or or let's not talk about that one? Do you you run into that often? I do not. Uh, That's good to hear. I'll I'll get it every once in a while, and it's usually – uh, on an issue like what, what we were just discussing. Well, GFCIs weren't required. Should, should we actually report them now? Uh, and, and I always tell them I've, I've, I've got to report all the conditions, but in the summary, I'm going to tell them or explain to them that it's, uh, it's, it's, it's an upgrade rather than necessarily a repair. So it's, it's very infrequent that I get, uh, any agents asking me not to report something. Sometimes right. the sellers will do that if they're uh, <laughs> if they happen to be there uh, during the buyer's inspection, and uh, so I just I just politically handle them and uh, move them along. All right. So what you're saying is we have a pretty ethical bunch here in San Diego. <laughs> you know, um, 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 my experience has been yes. Um, it's it's very rare that I've run into uh, agents that that aren't. To be honest. Well, I'm glad to hear that. Yeah. Uh, Let's do a little nitty-gritty here. As far as in the house, when it comes to the uh, overall structure of the house, the envelope of the house, what what are you looking for structurally? Uh, structurally, we're, we're, we're looking at the exterior. We're looking at what the uh, coverings look like, be it stucco, siding. Hmm. Are there obvious uh, issues there so far as buckled walls or walls that are shifting or moving? We're looking at what we can see of the foundation. If it's a slab foundation, there's not a whole lot we can see. If there's a crawl space, then, of course, we're going into the crawl space uh, to check the foundation and the floor structure there. Uh, the roof is probably one of the most important parts of the uh, envelope of the exterior. And if we can get on the roof safely, we're on the roof. If, uh, if it's a little bit too high, then I've got other tools that I can use for that. Uh, so we're looking for upkeep issues. Uh, again, obvious visual defects. We're not going to be opening walls up. Uh, I've got an infrared camera that can see uh, temperature differences on wall surfaces but can't see through walls necessarily. 
So it's just, a, again, a matter of setting expectations of we're looking for obvious, readily accessible visual uh, indications of any concerns. Okay. Now, you mentioned the infrared camera, and, I, and uh, I've seen other inspectors use them, too, on my listings. Uh, wh- what are you reading when, you, when you're seeing temperature differences in the walls? What is that actually telling you? Uh, it's telling us there's there's something that's causing a temperature difference on the surface. Now, an infrared camera can only see the surface it's looking at. Okay. And so <clears throat> let's say, for instance, there's a, a hot water line behind a wall. It's going to be causing a temperature difference at the surface of that wall, and I can see that temperature difference that it's causing. So I can use that camera now to look for water leaks that might be uh, hidden from view. Okay. I can also use it to determine if there are electrical outlets or electrical appliances that are overheating. I can also use it to determine how our comfort systems are performing. I can usually see the duct work within the walls by the temperature differences caused. So there's a there's a lot of really practical, and I, I I have found on a couple of occasions slab leaks uh, using the infrared camera because of the temperature difference that it causes. Okay, I want to talk about slab in a minute, but I um, also want to introduce your girlfriend at this point uh, because uh, you, your other piece of technology that helps you inspect roofs. You want to talk about her? Yes, uh, my pride and joy. Uh, it is a. Uh, Unique uh, Typhoon 500 uh, drone. Uh, well, not it's it's a quadcopter. A drone technically can be weaponized, and she cannot be weaponized. Um, <laughs> so uh, her name is Laura, and uh, she'll go to 4,000 feet in about 10 miles. She's GPS enabled, 16 megapixel still images, uh, 1080p video. And I I'm not a fan of heights. I don't particularly like ladders, and when I go on uh, Concrete tile roofs at 260 pounds, there's a good chance I'm going to break more tiles than I can learn about. And so I put Laura in the air. I let her take care of the inspection for me. Typical inspection, I'll take 60, 70 photographs, and uh, uh, I can pretty well tell you down to the granular level what the uh, surface of the roof looks like uh, from the drone. And that's That's been a great tool. Yeah, and that's one of the things that sets you apart because you're the only home inspector I've ever seen use drone technology for that because a lot of inspectors, including termite inspectors, simply won't do second-story homes or, or, or taller. And, and that puts you in a unique position to accept those jobs because we don't lose the ability to inspect the roof even if it's a two-story. Exactly. I've so, I've done as high as a three story roof before, so oh, and okay. Laura, Laura does not mind heights; she'll go four thousand <laughs> feet. So, uh, you know, I, we talked about the exterior and uh, the envelope of the house, including slab, and this may be unique to San Diego. I don't know in other parts of the country, but um, in San Diego, uh, we have a lot of slab foundation, which is basically just uh, similar to like a garage. It's just a slab of concrete poured, and then the house is built on top of it with no uh, crawl space or or um, basement. So what we're noticing, though, especially in our East County, uh, whether that's because of the heat or the seismic activity or the quality of the pour originally, is a lot of slab crack. And I'm curious when it's um, you know when when a slab crack is pretty uh, obvious that there's some significant damage, but there's a lot of slab crack that is less than the width of a pencil. Uh, how do you know? When you're inspecting, or do you know if a house is experiencing that when you obviously can't see the majority of the floor? Yeah, uh, there's there's a couple ways. Number one, if it's a slab, I'm I'm inspecting all the perimeter that I can see visually, and I'm looking for any indications of cracks. If I see, and and 95 percent of uh, uh, slabs have some degree of little micro cracks on them. Pretty much all concrete cracks to one degree or another. Uh, but I'm looking for larger cracks. If I see those indicators, I'm calling out that a foundation uh, contractor examine it more. Uh, another way to determine if there's a slab crack is to look at the water meter. Uh, that's the first thing I always look at when I do a house. I go to the meter really, and, and determine is the meter turning. 
because if the meter's turning, there's water running somewhere. If there's water running somewhere, then it's either an appliance or a slab leak. Uh, and I have seen a couple of uh, slab leaks that way, and then I confirm it with the infrared. Okay. Um, and then, uh, of course, walking on the house, very sensitive on the feet to see if you feel any slopes or rises, uh, because normally a foundation will buckle to a certain degree and you'll have a little bit of a rise to it. So there's a number of ways that way. But if in doubt, I always recommend that a foundation contractor uh, come in and examine it further. Well, and that's true of um, all the components of the house, too. I mean, I, I know I've, I've had clients say, well, you know, why do I got to hire a roofer if Glenn was just out there? And, and what, I, what I typically explain to people is you're kind of the general practitioner that you go see before you get referred to the specialist. Uh, I'm not going to go see a surgeon for a sniffle. Uh, unless while seeing you for the sniffle, you determine something else is. Uh, I sniffled, Thomas. All oh, right, uh, we're going to go for our, we're going to go for our break, folks, and then we'll be coming back and learning some more about the of the home inspector. Be back in a second, folks. We're coming back, folks. Hopefully, Thomas has got over his sniffles. We're, we're having a fascinating conversation about with the home inspector. It's like the school inspector, isn't it? You know, uh, um, so off you go, Thomas. Uh, Glenn, I never had an older brother, but having Jonathan as a co-host, got, it feels like it's close to it. <laughs> uh, all right, so uh, back to what we were talking about, the components of the house. Now, when it comes to electrical and plumbing um, and the appliances, to what degree do you inspect them before it's time to call in a specialist? Uh, well, let's start with the electrical. I uh, open the main panel, uh, inspect the interior of the panel. We're looking for wiring, breakers, uh, uh, melted bus bars, uh, scorched wires. We're also te- uh, testing all the electrical components within the house. Uh, every receptacle I can get to uh, physically, we're putting a tool in and testing. Uh, so when I see issues such as scorched wires, maybe there's openings on the front of a panel that somebody can stick a finger in and uh, and feel what 200 amps feels like, which will only hurt for a moment. Um, so at, at that point, uh, I've exceeded uh, my skills since I'm not an electrical contractor, and I recommend that electricians come in. Uh, plumbing, same thing. Uh, we're testing uh, functional drainage, functional flow, water pressure uh, throughout the house, all the fixtures, all the uh, bathrooms. If there are obvious uh, drainage issues or flow issues, then, of course, I refer those to plumbers. Um, pretty much every component of the house, when I see something that is outside the norm, uh, I'm calling it out either – either that a contractor should look at it or if it's a small little maintenance item, then I recommend that just a repair person look at it. Sure. So it's the reason why you're the first step in this process because, I mean, obviously it's a, it's a lot more cost effective to have you with a knowledge of all these components come out and give us a general report on the property before we start trying to schedule nine different specialists at, and not all of them do in, uh uh, estimates for free because if you want a report, that's typically when they start charging you. And you know, like an average roof inspection alone is three hundred bucks or, or more. Um, you know, HVAC plumbers, electricians. So this is a good first step uh, in inspecting a home, and then you can determine from there what is a uh, in need of more inspection and what you can live with. Some of the stuff you point out. Some of my clients, they're like, ah, okay, that's fine. You know, it's a, it's a 40-year-old home. I, I, I expect there to be some problems. Um, yeah. Actually, Thomas, can I ask a question? Please. Um, basically, I was thinking of three areas that I don't know. I don't know the property in your particular area, but um, the three areas that come to mind is asbestos, um, pests, um, termites, other similar pests, and increasingly, a lot of housing have have having solar panels put on them. Mm-hmm. And what are the specialised um, concerns around that? So, it's one question, but there's three parts to it. But I don't know any of those parts really affect you. Well, we're we're looking 
four areas that, that will commonly have asbestos, be it uh, popcorn ceilings uh, is a real common asbestos source prior to the early 80s. Uh, also asbestos vent lines on water heaters and furnaces. Mm-hmm. And we don't test for asbestos, but I call it out as a possible source and recommend that it be tested uh, for asbestos. Asbestos is... Uh, uh, if, if you leave it alone, it'll leave you alone. It's only when you disturb it and you make it into a talcum powder that it gets into your lungs and causes the health issues. So I'll usually brief clients by telling them, you know, leave it alone. If you're going to ever disturb it, get it tested for asbestos. <clears throat> if it's asbestos, then you need to have a, uh, uh, an asbestos remediator remove it. They come in with the uh, masks and all the special tools that they do. Uh, so far as solar, uh, that's best left to the solar uh, contractor. However, with the drone aircraft, I normally do inspect the solar panels just to see if they're if they're clean, uh, if they appear to be loose, if they appear to be properly installed. Uh, but when it gets into the inner workings of the solar controls, that's best left to the uh, solar contractor. And what was the third one again? Pests. Oh, pests. Pests and termites. I am not a licensed termite inspector, but I am looking for them. <clears throat> Normally, uh, we'll see indicators of possible termites. Now, a termite inspector is allowed to do a physical touch and, uh, uh, a probing inspection, whereas I'm not allowed to do that because I'm not licensed to put it back together again, uh, whereas the termite inspector is. So if I see indications of termites, I call that out and recommend that a termite inspector look at it. When I'm in an attic or a crawl space, if I see animal droppings or uh, rodent droppings, I'm calling those out and recommending that a pest uh, and termite contractor look at those. Yeah, and um, typically uh, we are in concert with Glenn having our termite inspector come out. Um, oftentimes on the exact same day, they're overlapping each other. So uh, that with uh, I don't again I'm not sure around the country how um, it affects housing, but uh, I've never dealt with termites more than in Southern California, uh, even compared to Northern California. Um, it's a it's a bigger issue down here because of our desert climate. Uh, it seems to be a breeding ground. But um, you know, uh, I appreciate you bringing that up, Jonathan, because you made me think of another question. Um, when it comes to swimming pools, since we're in Southern mm-hmm. California, what do you do about swimming pools? Do you inspect those? I inspect them from a generalist standpoint. When it gets into the um, the uh, heater functioning, the motor functioning, the pumps functioning. Uh, at that point, I recommend that we have an actual licensed pool inspector look at it. And the pool inspector's got to be licensed, but, uh, again, I don't have to be, but uh, which is <laughs> kind of odd. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, uh, uh, I've got a number of pool inspectors that I can refer. I'm sure you have guys you know as well. But uh, when it gets into the inner workings of the guts of the uh, equipment in the pool, I, I normally defer to a pool inspector for those. But I do look at the pool and spa from a generalist standpoint, uh, gates, door alarms, uh, the physical condition of the deck and the pool itself. Okay. And the same goes for uh, septic and wells because we, we do have a lot of those here in East County. Yep, same thing. Okay. Um, I wanted to ask you what um, – I, I can remember years ago my, my previous inspector being up in an attic and all of a sudden hearing yelling and screaming and – he had come across a family of raccoons living in an in an attic, <laughs> and I, I don't think they were too happy to, to see him. What's what's some of the oddest things you've seen during an inspection? Uh, boy, there's been a lot. I think the most uh, memorable was uh, a house I did out in Barona uh, about a year and a half ago. <clears throat> the house had been basically uh, 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 obliterated. I think is the best word that comes to mind. Uh, and, uh, all the fixtures in the bathrooms, for instance, were gone. And when I went to go inspect the, uh, master bathroom, the door was closed. So I, uh, opened it about two inches, heard the rattle of a rattlesnake. Oh. 
closed the door, uh, looked at the buyer and said, this inspection is over. And uh, her eyes were uh, about as wide as saucers, and she's nodding rapidly going, yes, this is over. So that was probably the oddest was uh, running into the rattlesnake in the uh, bathroom. Yeah. Kind of concerning. Um, other than that, uh, general, normal, weird stuff. Yeah. No ghosts or anything. <laughs> Have you ever, um, you know, one of the uh, problems people might not realize we have out here uh, um, is uh, beehives. Have you ever, we we, we actually have uh, beehive removal companies in San Diego. Uh, have you run into that? I have, yeah, particularly yeah. around chimneys. Yes. Uh, they seem to like to uh, hive around there. They can get inside under the rain cap and the spark arrestor and form a, a real nice little hive in there. So I see that quite a bit. We see a lot of mud hornets. We also see a lot of uh, black widow eggs, uh, particularly inside electrical panels. Uh, so, yeah, there's there's a number of things that we'll routinely see. <laughs> when you're um, done with an inspection, how do you deal with people coming back at you weeks later and they're saying, hey, you should have caught this, I found this, and they get all upset about something. A common one uh, I run into is a house has been sitting vacant for a while, and now all of a sudden there's a family of four using it, and the plumbing backs up. Right. And they can't understand why you didn't tell them that there was a clog in the drain or something like that. Right. And 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 that's a tough one uh, because uh, we do operate all of the plumbing fixtures uh, during the inspection. And uh, – Typical property inspection, I'm taking 200 to maybe 250 photographs. Uh, to be honest with you, the, the majority of those are defensive. Uh, I do take photographs, for instance, of uh, showers in operation. I take pictures of the drain pan to show there's no water backing up. But those photographs don't necessarily make it into the report. Uh, so normally, if, if, if somebody's got a real problem, I'll which really does not happen very often. I think I can count on maybe two or three fingers uh, the number of times that that has happened. But uh, I'll try to work with them and try to explain to them again, everything was working at the time of the inspection, uh, and then try to resolve it as peacefully as I can from there, because I'm not there to make them feel bad. All right. But uh, But I do have to explain to them, hey, the system was working that day, that's all I can tell you. What happened next week, I, I can't tell you. Um, so it's, it's, it's difficult. And like I say, thankfully, it's happened two or three times uh, out of the about a 1,000 inspections I've done so far. So, so I'm grateful for that. doesn't yeah. happen very often. I can remember one time you and I go into a house to do an inspection, and uh, I think it was out in La Mesa, and uh, we couldn't get the gas to work. And uh, went outside and found out that the gas meter had been yep. stacked, like like you know it looked like it was a functioning gas meter, but you touched it and the whole thing fell apart in like nine pieces. <laughs> Somebody had carefully put it all back together, um, yep. but it wasn't connected and it wasn't attached to either the components. So you, you do see some goofy stuff out there, and um, the reason I bring that up is uh, I'm bringing up a reinspection. Um, what what's your what's a policy of most home inspectors? Your policy included um, when something goes awry and you can't complete, you know, like you were mentioning the rattlesnake. Yeah, obviously you have to come back and reinspect. Um, is there a charge to do a reinspection fee? Well, it's on kind of a case by case uh, basis, but the normal reinspection fee is half of the original. Okay. Uh, and uh, normally what I'll do is I'll print out uh, my list of all the defects and maintenances and safety issues that I found and I'll go around the house and uh, re verify every one of them. And then if there are changes to make to the report, then I'll go back and issue a new uh, uh, property inspection report. Okay. And so, those don't happen very often either. I would say maybe once a month uh, at the most. Okay. Now, do you often see that, uh, or I don't even know if you're privy to this, but um, when that happens to an agent uh, representing a buyer, um, do you often see that the seller or the seller's agent picks up your reinspect tab since it was typically their, their doing that caused this? Yeah, norm, normally it's the seller's side that takes care of the reinspection okay. fee. And I, and I usually will tell 
let's say, for instance, that gas meter we found that was disassembled. Uh, I'll usually tell the agent, hey, this is not the buyer's problem. Uh, I would suggest that the seller's agent take care of it. And that way, if they weren't already thinking in those terms, yeah. they'll start thinking in those terms. That that's, that's, that's not the buyer's fault. You know, right. They shouldn't be held for that. Right. And I have had, and I don't know, maybe this isn't the best forum to say it, but I, I have had buyers that uh, the sellers just flat out refuse to pay for the uh, reinspection. And I've gone out there and just done it for nothing. Um, because I don't want to stress the buyers out. And it's usually not that big a deal, to be honest with you. So. Yeah, I appreciate that. And one other thing I wanted to mention when, since you bring that up is, uh, yeah, uh, and thank you for your service. You served in our Coast Guard. And yeah. one of the things I like about you is you give our military a, a military discount on their inspection. Yeah, so. military and uh, first responders. Uh, all the first responders get it. And that and it, that includes vets and retired. Yep. Um. Well, I want to thank you very much. Now, what we're going to do is um, we're going to segue from the audio portion of our show into the video portion only, um, and there I want to talk about uh, the book you wrote. Um, so we're going to um, wrap up the audio portion. Uh, is uh, and Any last questions before we do so, Jonathan? No, I think you uh, – it's not an area I know much about, actually, but um, I think we're it's – really, it's really interesting, actually, because it's a side – um, that most people just don't realize, really, do they, Thomas? No, no. It, you'd be, you know, it's something that because I'm in the business, I, you know, I take it for granted sometimes, and I have to always remind myself this may be the yeah. first time this person's going through something like this, even though it's probably the third time that week I am. Um, so, um, Glenn, uh, we're going to um, have you sign off on the audio portion, so why don't you share with people how they can reach you? Uh number of ways. Uh, you can find us... Uh, on the web at uh, inspectitfirst.com, with the first being the number one ST. And if you do a, uh, we're actually headquartered out of Cleveland. So if you go in there, select the map, go to California, you'll find I'm the only franchise owner in California. So it'll be fairly easy to find me there. Uh, you can always call me uh, anytime, uh, 619-905-0110. And I'm the one answering, so you don't have to worry about an answering service. Uh, <laughs> the only time I don't answer is when I'm in a crawl space or uh, flying the drone. Uh, and then you can contact me by email, uh, gkleint, which is K-L-E-I-N-T, at inspectedfirst.com, with the first being the number one ST. All and right. Those, you can also reach me through the ASHI website if you want to look me up there. And that's A S. H I uh, A S H I American Society of Home Inspectors. Okay, all right. And Jonathan, will you uh, share with people how they can reach you? Oh, it's quite simple, folks. You can either get me on Twitter at Jonathan Denwood, or you can get us on the Facebook page where you'll be able to see all our videos and additional information on the on the Mail Right Facebook page, or you can email me at Jonathan at Mail Hyphen Right dot com. Back to you, Thomas. And for me, you can reach me on my website, thomasjnelsonrealtor.com. Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn are where you can find me on social media. And, of course, in San Diego, California, I'm never too busy for your referrals. Uh, so if you're an out-of-area agent sending someone to San Diego, let's become referral partners. And, of course, um, I want to thank our guest, again, Glenn Client, Inspect It First, uh, thank you for joining us on today's show. And if you want to hear about Glenn's book that he wrote, as well as some other uh, bonus material, please join us now on our video component on YouTube. And Thomas and Jonathan, thank you for having me. Appreciate it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, must break as well. <laughs> All right. So. Now we're into the bonus material, and um, Glenn, I wanted to ask you about your book because I know you um, you wrote a novel. First of all, um, uh, it's it's called Offerings of Shiloh. Is that correct? That's correct. And uh, let's first of all, is the book out and uh, available for purchase? It is. It's on Amazon uh, as paperback, and also Amazon as Kindle. 
Okay. And this is, of course, a book about home inspections, right? Uh, no. <laughs> oh, it's not. So, so what the heck yeah, did you write a book about? <laughs> uh, it's, it's, it's a book about uh, the Civil War, uh, the American Civil War, uh, the Battle of Shiloh. Uh, which was in April of 1862. And uh, it, uh, it stemmed from a visit, actually, I took to Shiloh, which is in southwestern Tennessee, uh, back in 2006. And I've been to all the major Civil War sites, Gettysburg to Vicksburg and everything in between. Uh, Shiloh is... Uh, Gorgeous. It is physically gorgeous. Uh, it's on the Tennessee River, which is one of the few rivers in North America that flows northward. Hmm. Um, and uh, it's at a place called Pittsburgh Landing, which is just east of uh, Selmer, Tennessee, if you're familiar with Tennessee. But it's gorgeous, and it is the eeriest place I have ever been uh, in my entire life. Um, you feel the 20, history? Yeah, 24,000 guys. Uh, we're dead in two days. Wow. And, uh, so just walking the fields, it's, uh, yeah, it's, uh, there's, there's something there. And, uh, I, I really picked up on it, uh, when I visited and, uh, had to write a book about it. So it's, it's an historical novel. Okay. So it's a, it, in other words, it's a fictional story based on an actual event. Correct. Yeah. Okay. And, uh, it's, it's as historically accurate as I could make it. I've had a, Oh, dozens of Civil War reenactors who really take this stuff seriously. Uh, God bless them for it. And uh, I've had uh, dozens of them contact me and tell me how accurate it is, uh, down to down to the details. But all the all the characters are fictitious, mainly because I didn't want to get somebody wrong. Uh, right. I didn't want to uh, ascribe to somebody something they said or did that I couldn't prove that they said or did, just because I didn't want to dishonor somebody. So, uh, what do you think it is? I mean, we've, we've been in a lot of wars and, 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 and World War II is t uh, talked about a lot, but what is it about the Civil War that you think that, um, I mean, it compelled you to write a book. As you mentioned, there's Civil War reenactors. I don't hear much about World War I or World War II reenactors. What is it about our Civil War that has so many people, um, focused on that, that, they, that they, they seem to have a passion for the history of it? I think because it happened on American soil, uh, first off, and it was Americans uh, killing Americans. Mm. Uh, it was also, uh, and I, I, I don't know if it'll soon be surpassed, but there were more, cat, more deaths in the Civil War than all of the nation's wars combined. Wow. There were uh, 626,000 uh, fatalities in the uh, Civil War. Uh, and so you combine every other war that the United States has ever been in, you add them all up, and it does not come to the total that died in the Civil War. Yeah. Uh, and I think the Civil War was fought by uh, non-professional soldiers, most of the guys uh, thought it would be a real fun adventure to go on. Uh, some of the uh, forces uh, joined under the threat of the noose that was hanging over a tree. Uh, would you like to volunteer? Would you like to uh, take a dangle? Uh, and they chose to volunteer. So there were a lot of unwilling uh, participants, and most of the guys really didn't know what was going on. Uh, a lot of them did, but uh, a lot of them didn't. A lot of them had never left the uh, two-mile square radius around their house, and suddenly they're somewhere else. And it was just a uh, – it was, it, was, it was incredibly vicious. The, the tactics – or the, I should say the technology had uh, outraced the tactics. We now had cannons that could fire uh, – you know, to a half a mile away, but we were still doing Napoleonic uh, massed marches. And yeah. So a I, single, I never uh, got that. Yeah. Why they would just stand in a line and walk right towards it. That never made any sense. Well, because the soldiers were not professional soldiers, and so the only way the officers knew how to control them was to keep them massed. Uh. And uh, the fear was that if you let independent groups go, uh, eighty percent of them would end up uh, west of the Mississippi River because they would run. <laughs> right. And so the only way to control them, they thought, was to keep them in massed formations. And uh, 
So a single cannonball would blow up overhead and you had 50 yeah. dead guys. Uh, yeah. It was just, it was slaughter on a unprecedented scale. And, uh, yeah. Well, there, and there's a lot of strategy that you, I mean, I know from studying the Civil War too that you can bring to business. I mean, it's, it's mm -hmm. incredible the correlation. I mean, no, no better personified than in Sun Tzu's The Art of War, but, yeah. um, my, the reason I bring up your book and I appreciate that you writ, you wrote one, um, but you know, I know a lot of agents that, um, have written books or aspire to write books. Um, what, what was your process? I mean, it, you, how do you take it from this thought, hey, I, I should write a book about this, to actually doing it and then getting it published? Well, the uh, the published part is actually the easiest part. Uh, most uh, publishing houses will not touch first-time authors anymore. Right. And so the only way to go is self-publishing. And if you self-publish it on Amazon, it's it's incredibly easy. Okay. Uh, to do. It's difficult to get the book formatted properly, but uh, once you've done that, it's, it's super easy to do. The, uh, the process for me was kind of interesting. Uh, I, I play a lot of golf and most golfers will have some sort of a trigger mechanism. They'll, they'll lift, uh, the, the shoulder of their shirt. They'll touch their nose. They'll do something physically that tells them now I'm in the golf zone and mm. nothing else matters. And for me, it was, uh, I bought a, uh, I'm, I'm a big supporter of St. Jude uh, Children's Hospital. And for me, it was a St. Jude hat that I bought online. And uh, when I put the hat on, that was my trigger. And uh, nothing else mattered in the world as soon as I put the hat on. And I had many nights, hundreds of them. It took me five years to write. Wow. Uh, I had hundreds of nights where I would uh, start writing about five o'clock in the evening. And the next thing I knew it was midnight or one o'clock and <laughs> yeah. where I had been for the last six hours, uh, seven hours, I have no idea. Uh, but I know I was 25 pages further along. Nice. And, uh, so it's, it's, it's a lot of fun. It is, uh, it, it's a tremendous, and, all the characters are you. They will say and do anything that you want them to because <laughs> uh, you create them. Uh, and it's amazing how much you care about them after a while because uh, to this day, five years later, I still think about, uh, you know, Stan or Tanner or Alan or Levi or Samuel. And, and uh, I, I just hope I did everything for them I could. But it, it's amazing. They're still – well, they're, they're a party. They're you, yeah. right? And uh, so it's amazing how much I still care about my guys. And I, and I hope I did everything for them I could. But, uh, can, I, can I ask a question? Please. Uh, Glenn, you know, because of your research and the interest in the Civil War, was there a, a fact or something you didn't realize that really mm -hmm. surprised you through your research? You know, I, it was at Shiloh. Uh, there were two things. Number one was the, uh, <clears throat> the park ranger at the visitor center pointed out that soldiers in the Civil War didn't wear dog tags and there were no driver's licenses. Uh, yeah. there were no licenses yeah, at all. Point. So most of, most of the soldiers went into battle with no identification on them. And the park ranger mentioned the fact that, uh, you know, your brother or your father or your husband was maybe in this area, but they never came back. Mm. How long would you wait for them to come back? Because you have no idea what happened to them. And at Shiloh, there are seven mass burial pits that Grant dug the day after the battle, and he just dumped bodies in them. Mm. And so there's no idea who's in these holes. And that struck me. I had never really thought about that before. The other, and, and that just speaks to the incredible tragedy of the Civil War is that most of the guys, we have no idea who died. Uh, and the other thing was at Shiloh, they had a musket that had been found on the uh, battlefield. And the way they did it was they would, uh, you know, insert the musket ball in and then put the primer cap on, pull the hammer back, fire the, uh, the weapon, and then repeat. 
they had a, a musket that was there on the battlefield that had 13 mini balls embedded in the uh, barrel. So the soldier had loaded it and probably in his panic and horror had probably forgotten to put a cap on, had pulled the trigger. It had not fired, but he had not known it had not fired. He jammed another mini ball in and he did that 13 times. Wow. And it, it spoke to me of the absolute horror that you must have experienced to have reloaded your weapon 13 times and never actually discharged it. And uh, so what I tried to capture in this book is the absolute uh, horror of, of what that must have been like. Uh, uh, I don't know if I'm correct about that. That particular battle, Grant, wasn't it where he made, um, where the Union tactics really changed under his generalship, where in previous campaigns, the, Union, the federal forces had, had basically, even if they had um, caused quite large casualty to the um, to the Confederate side, they had redrawn. But the under Grant, under that particular battle, there was no redraw, even though it was a bloodbath. He just drawed on more reserves. Is that yes. correct? Yeah, that's that's correct, and and. It was a Sunday morning when the battle started, so half the Union forces were still asleep when the whole thing started. Uh, nobody could find Sherman, and Grant was uh, uh, downriver, so he was about 20 miles north of Shiloh, so he wasn't even aware that anything was going on. Uh, nobody knows how the battle actually started because uh, everybody that was there at the start was not around at the end anymore. Uh, so it's a very mysterious battle uh, that way. Uh, it ended up being a Union victory, mainly because the Confederates were out of supplies, and after the first day they started pillaging for supplies, shoes, food, coats, <clears throat> and they just kind of generally lost interest and started leaving. And then the next day Grant uh, counterattacked and they all ran away. Um, so it ended up being a Union victory. The casualties, though, were pretty well split. It was about 12,000 per side. Uh, but, uh, yeah. But it was it was ultimately a Union victory. Um, how, how have your book sales been going? You know, uh, it, it kind of trickles a little bit uh, now and again. I, I, I have about 3,000 likes on the Facebook page, which is not translated into sales, unfortunately. <laughs> but uh, – uh, every once in a while, I'll, I'll, I'll get a, you know, small check from Amazon, you know, for, uh, for, uh, sales. Um, I, I would love, I would love, this thing would make one heck of a movie, I think. And I would, if I could ever get somebody to make it into a movie, oh my God, this thing would be an awesome movie. Well, well, uh, we'll certainly hope for that for you. I mean, are you, yeah. prom- it sounds like you're promoting it though. You're on social media and does it have its own website? It, uh, it, uh, no, it does not have its own website, but it has its own Facebook page, uh, Offerings of Shiloh. Okay. And, uh, uh, it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's a fairly long novel. It's, uh, 412 pages of single space times New Roman 10 for those that are interested in that. Um, <laughs> and, uh, the battle starts about a third of the way through. And I will tell you when I wrote the battle scenes, I, I, I went through about a year where I couldn't sleep uh, because they are, uh, they're so fast, they're so frenetic and they're so vicious that I had about a year that I, I really couldn't sleep. And uh, so I, I've had a number of people tell me that uh, when they read it, they had to remind themselves that they knew who wrote it. Um, and uh, that that's not my personality, but the book gets down and dirty uh, okay. yeah, to the extreme. Uh, but it's not it's not gratuitous. It's just vicious. Right. Well, um, if people want to check out the book, uh, obviously they can go on Amazon, and and then there's right. the Facebook page. Um, Correct. All right. And and again, if they want to hire you as a home inspector um, uh, in San Diego County or Riverside County, correct? Uh, I go up into as far north as like Lake Elsinore area. Uh, so it's the southern part of of uh, Riverside. Okay. I've also gone as far out as. Uh, Brawley and uh, El Centro, but those were commercial inspections out there. 
Okay. And once again, will you remind people how they can reach you? Uh, best way is phone, 619-905-0110. Second best would be email, Glenn, uh, gkleint at inspectitfirst.com. And then the website and the ASHI website you can find me on. And I've got a, a Facebook page for the business as well. Well, Glenn, I really appreciate you coming on and um, both sharing your uh, knowledge about the home inspection and then uh, this little hidden treasure trove of you, know, you being an author. Uh, you know, there it's it's something that um, ceases to surprise me anymore in this industry. Um, I meet so many realtor authors, realtor musicians. Uh, realtor, jewelry makers, um, you know, and now that expands to uh, the home inspection <laughs> world too. Uh, we're, we're a lot of free spirits in this industry. <laughs> yes, indeed. <laughs> Jonathan, will you remind people how they can reach you? Oh, it's no problem, folks. The best way is to go, use Twitter or go to the Mail Right Facebook page and leave a comment on this video. We love more to get more feedback. Uh, that'd be great. All right, and once again, I'm Thomas J. Nelson, residential realtor here in San Diego, California. You can reach me at thomasjnelsonrealtor.com, social media, and my phone number is 858-232-8722. Whether you have comments about the show, um, if you have uh, questions about real estate, or you want to network about real estate, I'm your guy. And, of course, we would love to uh, hear from you on our iTunes or Stitcher uh, posts where you can um, – Leave comments about our uh, episodes on uh, on our day, our weekly show. All right, we'll be back next week with another fantastic guest. And once again, Glenn, thanks so much for being on our show today. <laughs>